The defence of Australia during World War II is an interesting subject. The military and political leaders of the time were seriously brought into question whether they were even capable of dealing with the situation at hand. Not to help their cause was this line called the Brisbane Line. Now, it was supposed to be in a defensive line running from Brisbane to Adelaide. It was going to be the last line of defence and Australia was going to withdraw all its forces to the southeast corner and only defend that part of the country. The rest of the country would go defend itself. Now, some very interesting documents were provided to us just recently and they were marked secret and most secret. And they explain how Australia's military leaders were going to prepare themselves against a possible invasion. Those documents were known as Defence of Australia. The direct threat to Australia becomes very real in December of 1941 when the Japanese Imperial forces will attack the island of Hawaii and the bombing of Pearl Harbour. But they also attack the islands of the Philippines and Hong Kong. During the same period of time, they attack numerous targets throughout the Asia Pacific area. Some battles will last a few hours, but the fall of Hong Kong on the 25th of December, which is less than three weeks after it started, is an ominous signal to the Australian military that they need to prepare for an invasion. Now there's a Lieutenant General Ivan McKay and he will come up with a plan to defend Australia. Now he realises he doesn't have a lot of men, they're not very well trained and he doesn't have a lot of equipment. So he puts up a proposal to defend the cities of Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. So he's going to cordon off that area and the garrisons of Townsville, Darwin, Perth and Hobart are going to be left as they are. He's not going to take anything away from them but he's not going to reinforce them because he doesn't have enough manpower and he puts that proposal up to a Mr Ford. He's a Minister for Army. Now other military leaders have a look at this plan and they go, yeah, it makes pretty good sense. They're going to take that to the War Cabinet, but on the 8th of February is the beginning of the Battle of Singapore, and that's over within a week. By the 15th, Singapore's fallen, it's gone. 17th, two days later, they take this proposal to the War Cabinet and they say, this is what we want to do, and the War Cabinet says, no, no, not doing that, I'm not having a bar of it. We are going to defend the whole of the populated areas of Australia and we're going to do everything within our ability and everything within our power to make sure the enemy never gets a foothold in Australian soil, on Australian soil. So you can see that the political masters were not going to just hive off a piece of Australia and protect it. They were going to protect the whole thing. So they say to the Joint Chiefs, go away and do a new appreciation for the defence of Australia. The following day, the War Cabinet will issue a note to say they want to withdraw all Australian forces from overseas. Most of those guys are serving in the Middle East. They're going to bring them home. They're also going to approach the Canadian and the American governments for additional troops to help defend Australia against invasion. Now that all takes place on the 18th, on the 19th, the Japanese bomb Darwin. So you can see how fast that war is moving and how quickly the Imperial Japanese forces come through the Asian Pacific area. Now on 5th of March, the Joint Chiefs will go back to the War Cabinet with their new appreciation and they've identified Darwin as being number one target and they've got a strategy to defend it, but they're running late. No one's anticipated just how fast this army or this war was going to progress through Asia. So they've got all this strategy in, in place to defend the northern part of Australia, but it's North Queensland they think is where the Japanese are probably going to make their invasion force. And so the, they will issue orders to reinforce North Queensland. They issue orders to withdraw General Blamey from overseas. He's going to become Commander-in-Chief of the Anzac area. And so you can see by the 5th of March, the momentum has gathered to start to develop a plan to defend Australia. Meanwhile, up in the Philippines, General Douglas MacArthur has been fighting one losing battle against the Imperial Army. And by the middle of March, He's been pushed back so far into the Bataan Peninsula that Roosevelt, the President of the United States, says to MacArthur, we're not going to win this, mate. We're going to get overrun. You are going to go back down to Australia. We're going to relocate you to Australia, where we're going to use that as a springboard, as a counteroffensive against the war in Asia. And so MacArthur will arrive here in Darwin on the 17th of March, 1942, at the Battery Airfield, it's about 100 kilometres south of Darwin, and Australia has already been bombed over 10 times by then. So MacArthur will take the plane down to Alice Springs, where he'll catch the GAN, which is a train, 
down to Adelaide and on to Melbourne where he'll set up his first headquarters. Douglas MacArthur, on his train journey down from Alice Springs to Adelaide and on to Melbourne, will have to stop here at Tarare and its very famous railway station in South Australia, where you have to change trains. Now he's travelling with his wife and son. Now Douglas MacArthur's journey is supposed to be a secret. You don't keep too many secrets now back in Australia in 1942, because when he steps onto this platform, half the people in Tarare here to meet him. And there's a big cheer as they see him get off the train. So he walks up to the end of the platform and he'll salute the people of Tarare. But it's here they also gives his first interview with the press where he explains to them why he's here in Australia. And he says that he was ordered here by the President of the United States. He was told to break through the Japanese lines and make his way down to Australia. He believes the primary purpose of that is America is going to mount offensive against Japan with a primary purpose with the relief of the Philippines. I've come and I shall return. And when Washington hears that, they go, General, can you amend that to we shall return? But as we know, General Douglas MacArthur will keep those words, I shall return, right throughout the war. But they were first uttered right here where I'm standing on the Tarare railway platform. But when he gets down to Melbourne on the 24th, a few days later, he'll catch up with General McKay, who's in command of home forces here in Australia. And he says to General McKay, I don't think that the battle for Australia will be fought on Australian soil. He said, I think it's going to be fought elsewhere. General Douglas MacArthur is not in the country for more than about two weeks. He's got a temporary headquarters set up down there in Melbourne, and he's up here in Canberra giving a presentation to the War Cabinet. He explains that he was ordered down to Australia by Roosevelt, but, uh, and if he had his way, he would have stayed in the Philippines fighting the Japanese. He gives them a bit of an overview on just how efficient and how the Japanese tactics have worked and how coordinated the Army, Navy and Air Force are. He says to them he doesn't believe that the Japanese will actually try to invite Australia. He said that the reward is not worth the risk, but if they do, it's the way of the Japanese showing their superiority in the Asia Pacific region. He said they may try to set up some airfields in Northeast Queensland, but either way, in his opinion, that would be a tactical blunder. He gives them an overview of the war in Europe from America's perspective, and he says that the war or the fighting between the Germans and the Russians, until that sorts itself out, no one's quite sure how that war in Europe is going to progress. So he said this is an opportunity for America to focus on the war in the Pacific. He is quite surprised at just how fewer troops and equipment we have here in Australia. And he says to John Curtin, look, America doesn't have enough ships and enough equipment to service both theatres of war. And he believes that the war in the Pacific from a tactical point of view is more important to America. So he says to John Curtin, the Prime Minister of Australia, I need you to get on to Roosevelt and I need you to ask him for men and equipment down here to, so we can use this as a springboard for our re-offensive back into Asia. Because Douglas MacArthur wants to get back into the Philippines fighting that war because when he said, I shall return, I think he meant it. 25th of April. General Douglas MacArthur, Commander-in-Chief of the Western Pacific Area, is going to issue his second operational instruction. He has information at hand that the Japanese Navy has a massive, very large task force in the Solomons area and it's steaming south. Now he's going to issue the orders to the Allied Navy that are to intercept that task force and to prevent its southern movement south to attack any hostile shipping they come across. But more importantly, they are to resist and attack any attempt that task force has on invading Australian soil or Papua New Guinea at Port Moresby. Now while Douglas MacArthur wasn't convinced they were going to invade Australia, he wasn't going to take any chances either. On the 4th of May will be the beginning of the Battle of the Coral Sea and it's the first naval battle where ships don't even see each other and it is a birth of naval air warfare and that takes place only 300 kilometres off the coast of Queensland and that's half the distance between Sydney and Melbourne. So that's how close they came. And that battle will go on for four long days, testing man and machine.
At the end of the Battle of the Coral Sea on the 8th of May, it's pretty much agreed that the Japanese Navy had a tactical win, but they've lost that initiative and their drive to push south. We know from documents that discovered after the war, the Japanese had never intended on invading Australia, but they did give it some very serious consideration. The Japanese Navy was always in favour of it, but the Japanese Army said it would take 10 divisions or more, and it didn't have that sort of manpower. But what they were looking for was Port Moresby, because they believed by invading Port Moresby and controlling that, they would be able to annex Australia out of the war. That means America and Australia wouldn't be able to set up a base here that was effective in a counterattack back in Asia. Now, the Japanese didn't give up on Port Moresby, they're going to try to do it by land. And they land at the top end of Papua New Guinea in July of 1942, and they'll make their way across the Owen Stanley Ranges, and by September, they've almost got Port Moresby in their grasp. But they've run into the Australian Army, the Australian Imperial Forces, and they're going to give the Japanese its first setback in the World War II, and they're going to push them back through the Owen Stanley Ranges in a campaign that'll be known as the Kokoda Trail Campaign. That battle will go on for months and it is going to go alongside the names of Gallipoli, the Somme, Tobruk, and Long Tan. But the Kokoda Trail campaign will be redefining the defence of Australia right to this very day.